Thank you for coming. My name is Amy. I'm a librarian here at the Ann Arbor District Library. I'm also a member of the Low Brow Astronomers uh, at the University, and uh, that's where I met Brian, who is our speaker tonight, and who is going to tell you everything you need to know about how to communicate photographs of the Milky Way with your camera. Uh, Brian has a BA in chemical uh, engineering um, and an MBA and a PhD in business, but now he is in semi-retirement where he has a more time to share his love of all aspects of astronomy from scientific research to public outreach to taking photographs of the night sky. So thank you so much for coming, Brian, and here he is. Thank you, Amy. Yes. Uh, we are going to have a lot of fun here. We have a, a, an intimate group, so we can have all of your questions answered. I want to make sure you, you go home with no questions unanswered. And uh, this is something I just love to do. I was doing it last night till one o'clock in the morning. Thank you for giving us space. And I brought one of my pictures. So this is an example of what we might want to be going for. Uh, and uh, it's, it's taken up the top of Michigan, not far from the bridge, okay, near on a way. Um, but that's the summer Milky Way. And you got some trees and you got reflections of stars in the water. So you got a nice foreground. So I just want to bring an example. Um, can you see this right here? That's the horse. That the, the horse. There's a, a leg and a leg and a, and a nose right there. That's the, that's the Milky Way horse. The dark horse, the Milky Way. Or is there another name for it? Name? That's what I call it. The Milky Way horse. So, just raise your hand at any time. We're going to get into anything you want to get into, but I just want to uh, focus this on beginning photography. Myself, I became an astronomer when I saw a lunar eclipse when I was 12. And I asked my parents what it, what it was, and they gave me kind of an answer that I didn't like. So then I went to the library, and I had all my books and read everything about it. Then, I, then as astronomers do is you get bigger and bigger telescopes until you hurt your back. So I even got an observatory, a big telescope. This telescope required a ladder to reach the eye. Um, but then when digital cameras came out, I got rid of the, the, tele the big telescope. I had the idea of telescopes. Pictures. And I started taking pictures and having displays. And I have a little display at the Ann Arbor Art, um, Art Gallery downtown um, about eight years ago. And I like displaying them and explaining them. And uh, so I have a ton of fun doing this stuff. And, uh, and so I want to show you how to do it. Okay? And so the theme about taking pictures of space is like climbing a mountain. It is step by step, it's very exhilarating, okay? But it is work, and there are ups and downs. And so um, it, it's, uh, it's never the same, never boring, but um, it's like when you reach a peak, a sub peak, you're like, wow, this is great, look what I did. And you realize, ooh, the next peak is even higher, but I'm gonna go for that, because you just get it so excited. So that, I just gotta warn you, is once you start getting on this mountain and taking pictures, you start with your phone and getting a picture of the Milky Way and say, ooh, that's pretty good. And then what can I do? And then once you start doing this, just watch out. It's, it, it's addicting and can be tough to find. So it's rewarding, but it is a mountain of difficulty. And this kind of is an illustration of the mountains. You're starting with things in the lower left, which are close to us, right? Does anybody know what this is? It's the falls, it's the Columbian Falls, that's the lower falls, okay? So that's that's close to us, all right? But now we've jumped off into space, we've got some star constellation, it's from further away, it's, it's a little bit of a smaller object. Now we're, we're actually taking a picture of the Orion Nebula, which is right, right there. So that is this. So we need more magnification, more difficulty, more expense, and at the top, you know, galaxies and galaxies are far, far away, right? Millions of light years away, and we love taking pictures of them. They're really cool, but they're the most hard thing to do. They're at the top of the mountain, okay? So that's difficult, expensive equipment, okay? So tonight, we are staying here, okay? We're going to focus on this. And so I always tell people, to, don't try to go to the top of the mountain right away. I mean, you can't just helicopter your way to the top of the mountain. you got to start the flow and work your way up. And so this is what each of these things are. And so we're talking about nightscapes right there. 
and then you could give uh, pictures of the sun and the moon and constellations. It's a little bit harder. And then if you want to take pictures of nebulas and good pictures of planets, it's harder. Galaxies and hearts. And what's different about this now is you're looking at the millimeters of the lens. Okay, here is wide angle, right? It, it, so you can see a lot. And your phone can do this, right? Your cell phone can go from wide angle to almost pretty good telephoto, right? The miracle of, of cameras and our phones now. <laughs> a lot of great things. So the cell phone is in, the, in that zone. So to do the nightscapes, we need a wide angle and the cell phone. Then as you want to take pictures of things further out, you need more magnification, longer focal length. And then over here and to the right, you gotta get a telescope. And that's just a whole expense and difficulty that you don't want to get into right away. An example of all the equipment we'll be talking about and the costs. I urge people just use what you got or borrow what you what you need. Okay, don't want to spend much money. So you can start as little as 500 because you got a phone in your hand, right? Or you got a phone on a tripod. Right here. This is just a wonderful way to get going. Phone on a tripod. You do not need. I'll put it over here so the camera can see a little better. Phone on a tripod, or a camera on a tripod, not a phone. Although you do need a tripod even if you use your phone. So that, that's the, the easiest thing. And oh, I want to get a little more sophisticated. I want to get a tracker. Okay, we'll talk about trackers. And so you can get that. That's the next level up. And then you're off, off to the races up to the right. We're not, we're not going to get into that stuff. We get fancy telescopes. And, and then you go crazy, you get a telescope that's remote control that's located in the desert, like I have. So um, we're not going to get into that too much, but it's, uh, we live in an exciting time where there's technology that's impacting everything. And uh, I just keep, became aware of something that uh, could make this obsolete. Pretty amazing for, for a quarter of the price. So, what is it? It's, uh, Where is it? it's a, uh, basically, it's a telescope. You just set it up, turn it on, attach it to your phone, it starts taking a picture of space. And there's one coming out for $500. This was something that was $5,000 when it came out a few years ago. So it's been announced, it's not available yet, $500. But it takes pictures more of a narrow field of view, stuff further out. You know, those nebulas and galaxies, it does not do the wide field, it can't do that. But it's revolutionary, amazing. The company that's making the ones that's cost 3000 now, they're toast. When the new, when the $500 one comes out, it's just, it's just amazing. So technology just marches on. So we're talking about nightscapes, and this picture on the left is that one right there. And on the right, you have Bryce Canyon. And the Milky Way coming up over Bryce Canyon, and uh, the, uh, that picture on the left was just one, like a three-minute exposure, and in the Bryce Canyon one, that was two pictures: one where I tracked the stars, and one where I didn't track anything, and we got the rocks. Then, through the miracle of Photoshop, we put them together. Now there are other programs that have just come out now. This software is a big innovation and there's software that I've recently seen that will kind of make that put those two together quickly and almost automatically whereas I had to spend hours stitching them together so and then the northern lights are something you also want to get a picture of and you can use the same tools that we're going to talk about tonight okay and uh, here's what you can do with the phone I got a pixel 7 and I took these in January at um, the Everglades, Everglades National Park. So watch on the lower right. So it's a little time lapse. And you can see the stars move. So, and that's just it. All I did was I took a, my camera, put it on a little $15 tripod. You got that. 
no processing, no photoshopping, nothing. So the latest phones from Samsung, Apple, and Pixel are all amazing. And next year's, I mean, I can't even imagine what they're going to do next year. So, okay. So we've talked a lot, I've talked a lot now, and I haven't given you any good, useful information. So now I'm going to give you useful information. How do I get a good Milky Way shot? First is equipment. Now, it's amazing when I talk to people about doing this, it's all about the equipment. The equipment, the equipment. But what am I, what am I buying? How do... Equipment is a small fraction of success. I'll try to tell you, that's one of the biggest takeaways I want to give you is don't get hung up on the equipment. Okay? Ansel Adams didn't have this. I did pretty crude stuff, although it was good for the it was really great for the time. But so equipment. Camera with a wide angle lens. I'm not telling you the brand. I'm not telling you any. I'm just telling you wide angle lens. Because once you're taking a picture of the Milky Way, the Milky Way is big, right? How big is the Milky Way? It's I mean, you know, it's that big. It, it's be cool, you want it to be 90 degrees, but 45 is great. So, wide angle lens, sturdy tripod, and this is barely meets that criteria. This I brought this delivery because we were talking about getting started, and this is a, a cheapo, right? This is one you can get for $15 on Amazon, right? And a way to take long exposures. So, you got to go manual somehow, okay? And so you gotta have fine way to take it out on exposures. And Amy has brought her intervalometer, which we'll talk a little bit more about if you just plug this in, and this allows you to take any exposure you want. You just tell it what. And if you want to take one of them, it'll do one. If you want to take 500, it'll go 500. Go all night. So that's a way. So I've just been making it very simple here. Location. Very important. It's just as important as the equipment. Dark sky with no light pollution. So, can you get pictures of the Milky Way in downtown Ann Arbor? No. Not if you have fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment. You're not going to get pictures. I, I was just racking my brain saying, if I had an infinite, infinite budget, and I was in downtown Ann Arbor, could I get a picture of the Milky Way over the Ann Arbor Library? I don't think I could do it. I was thinking maybe lots of filters, you know, special filters. But no, you can't filter out all light pollution and still get the Milky Way. So you got to get out where it's dark. That's the biggest challenge. I got to get in the car. You got to get in the car. And I'll tell you where to go. Time. Me. Late summer evenings are optimal. This is it, man. This is it, folks. Right now, we are in the prime Milky Way season. That picture was taken about this time of year, August. So this is it. And what's also good is that our weather's good now. So, and the mosquitoes are not so bad now. <laughs> right? So this is like the, what's it, my favorite time of year. August and September in Michigan is my time of year. So you gotta have the right equipment. You gotta go to some place. And you got to go do it during the right time. One other thing I didn't put on here, which I'll talk about. Also, with dark sky, no moon. Moon is bad. Um, unless it's a little crescent moon, you know, it's kind of, it could uh, lighten up your picture, a little bit of a crescent. But a big moon, it's going to blast the Milky Way away. So, we don't like the moon. I don't like the moon. I just like the moon. So, and then, Post-processing is required, and this is what trips people up. Um, a lot of people don't like that. They don't like the photoshopping. They don't like the tweaking. They don't you like using the software and the hassle, right? Moving files around, taking the files out of the camera, putting them in the laptop, playing with them, and some people just think that's a pain in the butt, and it kind of is. Now, your phone does a lot, but you have to do some processing, okay? Yeah, you can go to look at the professionals and see amazing pictures um, and see that right out of the camera, it's just kind of weak and washed out. you got to do the post-processing to have a great picture. Um, I will tell you that I 
cheated on this one here. This is the person meteor shower, and the picture contained one meteor. Well, I had three other pictures that also contained meteors, and I copied them and pasted them in the same spot as this picture. So there is some cheating on this. But that's an advantage. That's a, an example of post processing. But I tried to be honest by putting them in the place where they did appear an hour later. Any questions? There's been no questions so far. So, yes. 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 Um, there is a whole lot of processing in the camera. It's magic. Yes. Uh, like the Pixel or any of the phones that are doing night stuff now, they're taking tons of little exposures and finding the best ones and then stacking them up. And you can't stop that. And they're also cranking up the the uh, color and the uh, contrast. You can't adjust much of anything. Yeah. So, equipment, location, timing, and post processing. Those are the four things you got to do. And even if you use a phone. So let's go into each one in detail. The equipment, the camera, uh, DSLR or mirrorless are great. This is a DSLR. This is a Canon uh, 6D. And Amy brought her 60, which is also similar. And uh, then you can, and she has, as you can see, lots of lens, lots of glass. If you see lots of glass, you say, good, lots of glass. If you see a small hole, a little window with glass, you say, no, not as good, okay? It's lots of glass, because that's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, why, why it is good. Those, you know, the point and shoot cameras, they're called, you know, they're non changeable lenses. Those can work, but uh, you got to be able to go manual on them. So the inexpensive ones won't work because you just can't go manual. Like, how you can't set a 30 second exposure, right? And you can't put it on infinity. So, but some of the newer good ones do, do work there. And the phones, yep. any any recent phone will work. Um, any of them, uh, Apple, Pixel, Samsung, or or these are the Chinese brands are darn good. The lens, wide angle, okay, ten to thirty millimeters, meaning it can fit in this much or this much. Okay, fast is best. Does anybody uh, want to know what? Focal speed is? Yes. This is the lens. And this is the sensor. So the lens goes down here and focuses on the sensor. The ratio between the focal length and the diameter. So that's L divided by D. Sorry, my handwriting is horrible. Equals the F focal ratio. Okay, so this looks like what you know. That's it's like three. There's there's three D's for every FL here. So that this is like F three. But what if we had that? That's an F one. That doesn't exist. <laughs> if, it, if they did, I'd buy it. Okay. The best we can do is 1.4. They just came out with a 1.4, and I really, really was drooling over it. And then I realized it doesn't work on my camera. So, what, see, what that does is that lots of glass lets in lots of light, and the Milky Way is kind of faint. So, you want, oh, so you want faster is better. Okay, so now people are a little bit grumpy. Because I tell them, well, your zoom that you came with the camera, oh, not that great. Not bad. You can still get a picture of the Milky Way. I've gotten good pictures of the Milky Way with a zoom lens. But the ones that came with the camera, you know, it's like an 18 to 55, that's f4.5. You know, it's, it's like way long. So it's not, it's a small little piece of glass in the front. So it, you can do it, but it's just, it's just, um, Going to be hard for you. You need to do longer of the exposure. Any questions about this? This is the technical part. 
Okay, so a wider angle is better, faster is better, prime is better than the zoom. And uh, this, for the, I guess we can get into the details. This is a 14 millimeter f2.8. It's by Rokanon or Sanyang. $280. This thing is amazing. This is the, the best bargain in photography is this $280 wide angle lens. That picture was taken with this. And it is better than the $2,000 equivalent from Canon. And they're coming up with kind of every day. And which one, Amy, what's your, the one you have here? It's, it's the same. Same thing? Yep. Yeah. So, uh, and, and they're available. So, really. Um, which is, which company is it from? It's a Rokanon, also called, it goes by three names Rokanon, Sam Yang, and there's a third one. But uh, if you do any Googling on 14 millimeter wide angle lens, you'll get it. It's Rokanon or Sam Yang. Rokanon is the bigger name. So that is uh, it's a no brainer. Also, uh, the camera mall, you know, here in town is a great resource, wonderful people. Just going in there and just chat with them, and they can show you stuff. And uh, they're just, anybody use them? They're, they're, they're wonderful, aren't they? Yeah, so uh, definitely get out there and, and they'll let you rent them and try them, right? Yeah, I just rented a lens a couple of weeks ago, a wide angle lens, taking a picture of the And how much did it cost for how many days? Uh, I rented it from Friday to Monday for uh, $90. Yeah. $90. $90. And which lens was that? It was a uh, 20 millimeter. I have a I have a Nikon C now. Yes. So it was a 20 millimeter. It's their ultra wide. Excellent. It was a one one point eight to two something. Fast lens. Yeah. Did you catch any meteors? Yes. I got spotted in one shot. <laughs> <laughs> in, when did the clouds hit you? We didn't get clouds. We, we, were, we, were, we were, yeah. We were. Okay, I'm not happy to hear that because I at two o'clock, I'm done. Clouds. Oh. <laughs> no, no, we we were. We left. Yeah, I think oh. we left around one thirty. Oh wow! Well, very jealous. But but we yeah, it was great. I'm very jealous. You, yes. So yeah, so Milky Way is a great, but also uh, if you can get a Milky Way and a meteor, holy cow, that is like the best. Okay, so we've yeah. talked about lenses. And one other thing about yes. renting a lens, it's usually uh, the rental is usually about one tenth of what uh, the lens would cost uh, to buy new. Yep. So ninety dollars, you get to figure it out. Yeah. Well, the other thing, the thing about Camera Mall is that you rent a lens from them and then you buy the lens from them. They they take the rental off of the cost of the lens. Yeah, they're, they're great. Yeah. yeah. So, they, so if I decide to buy that lens, I can get $90 off on it. Yeah, they are uh, um, they're a throwback to an earlier time. Yeah. yeah. I just can't believe they opened. It just, we lost all the camera stores. You know? yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're the only ones. They're the only ones. They're great. Oh, I, I bought a nice ball head, you know, there used, and it was it's just wonderful. So, uh, yeah, many different cameras you could use. The Sony is, we were talking about the Sony before we started. Sonys are great. They're mirrorless. Their, their, their sensors are the best. They're really good. But, uh, and they have lots of wide lenses there. Um, and then a tripod. Okay. You got to have a tripod. This is kind of rickety, but it'll work. Um, and... If you don't have a fast lens, if you're using a, a zoom lens or something that's higher than a four, you're going to probably need to track the stars because you need a longer exposure. Because the lens is not big enough to let in light, and those stars are moving. We're moving. So you need a tracker. And so this is a tracker that Amy brought. And this will, once you like look through this and point it at the North Star, it'll follow wherever the camera's pointed for the whole night. It's got batteries in it, and it's about $400. Comes with a tripod, and this will even work for it uh, if you move up to a telephoto. So there's these trackers, you can see there's many good ones. This one's called Skywatcher. 
but there are trackers out there from 250 to let's say 450, and they're fantastic. And uh, but you don't need this. You can start with that. I'm not telling people to go out and spend a lot of money. Use what you have. Okay, go out and play with it. Learn a lot because you'll learn a lot and have fun. And then you might say, hmm, maybe I should get a tracker. And then you get a tracker. Do they sell these at Cameron Mall? Probably not. But um, no, if you don't want to uh, do technology, if you're good with making stuff, Graham can tell us about how you can make your own tracker. Right. Yeah, this is this is way cool. This is like a throwback technology. So this is called a bar door mount. You've got two pieces of wood that are hinged here. The hinge acts like the. Well, let me give you. Let me give you the mic. Okay. Yeah. This is important. We don't want to miss it. Or oh, you can choose that. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to miss this. You better start over. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, so you've got the two pieces of wood hinged together. So you align the hinge with Polaris, just like you would the polar scope on the amount. And the knob at the bottom, they've got it worked out, so it's one quarter 20 red screw. And if you turn it a certain amount, you match the rotation of the stars in the sky. Um, and then the little ball has a knot you can Mount your camera to the top of that, and for fifteen to twenty dollars, you got a star tracker. See, you just turn this. Isn't that amazing? How much in parts is that? Um, the ball head is the most expensive part, so everything with uh, including the ball head, fifteen to twenty dollars. Trip to the hardware store, get the ball head on Amazon, and you're all done. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Love that. So yeah, and so he's going to show people how to make that. So uh, that is brilliant. So you can make a tracker, and you can get up there and, and uh, track it. And so um, let's talk about uh, the exposure. Exposures. The shortest you're going to get by with is probably 20 seconds. If you're out in Cyan and Bryce, like we were talking about, that's a dark, dark place, or the UP. You're probably still going to need 20 seconds, right? Is that kind of the minimum? And then up from there, okay? Because if you have a tracker, you can go as long as you want, but the track will smear the trees, right? So you got to got to watch it. It's kind of a balancing act. But um, I've often done shots of 300 seconds. So, but usually they seem to be in the 20 to 60 second range. Go. So, that's the equipment, very important, and this is what usually people want to talk about. Any questions? Usually people say, I got this, will it work? Okay. And phones are great. And uh, you, you know those really nice tripods are the ones with the bendy legs. Awesome. They hold the phone really well, and then you can actually uh, use the bendy legs to attach it to something. Really great. And what, $20 on Amazon? So. Definitely get one of those. So that's the equipment. What's the next thing? Oh, the, the under barometer. These things are on Amazon for $20. Just make sure you've got one that will fit your phone. There's like 10 of these. They are not universal. I bought the wrong one. Okay? They, they all, all the plugs are a little different in, in the phones or in the uh, cameras. Dew control and red flash. Like, you know, when the, sky, when the sky is clear, there's usually dew, right? They kind of go together. And if you point this up like that, that's a lot of glass, and dew loves this. Dew will come on here, it will be on there in seconds. What do you do? Well, you can spend some money, you can get a little uh, rubber band or a, a, a Velcro strip that warms up, that comes with a little battery pack. How much is that? Thirty bucks. So you can do that. But if you want to spend two dollars, you get hand workers, right? And then you just open them up and you take the rubber band and you attach them to the bottom. This is your two dollar um, do control. They work great because they'll go most of the night. So, and uh, it's best if you put them on the bottom because then heat rises. This is fantastic. All right, 
And then the other thing you have to use, like Amy has this, which is a um, red flashlight. It's, it's blinding me. Where did it put mine? It's on the track button. Thank you. Anyhow, um, it's very rude to go out there, especially with other people, to have um, a bright light. So this is really good. Because red light allows us to maintain our night vision, right? No, oh, it's too bright, Brian. I know, it's too bright. <laughs> and these things do not adjust. They can put stuff over it, but as Jim says, this is still way too bright. But with the head, it's really nice to have one on the head because then you're at night, you're doing this stuff, right? You're, you're fiddling with all the settings or on your phone. And it's nice to have uh, a headlamp. But if you can get one that is adjustable, it's even better. Or you can just put more red plastic over it to dim it down slightly. Because hopefully you're going to a place that's dark. Yes? You can also get one that's like a baseball cap and the red lights are recessed into, back into the cap. And there are two red LEDs. They have a couple of phone batteries and the red to power them. And you don't blind the, uh, people you're out uh, observing. And you don't blame yourself because you do want to be able to enjoy it. Once you've set it all up and it's taken bigger, you want to step, step away. So yeah, very important. And our phones are way too bright. Uh, you know, if you can't get a, a red app, right? There's an app you can get on the phone that turns everything red. If you can't do that, at least turn the, turn the brightness all the way, all the way down. So that's really important. So these are the two things that these are two insider tricks. I want to tell you the do control and the red light. You got to have that. Then you be a professional. <laughs> so that's the stuff you got to do. And then what's our next thing? You got to get there. Dark place. Light pollution map. I'll show you some light pollution maps. You got to go where there's no light pollution. Downtown Ann Arbor is bad. Downtown Detroit is horrific. Um, where do I go? Parks, campgrounds. I, I just take a picture by the side of the road. And I've had people come out and, and uh, say, what are you doing? But once you explain and show them, they're like, oh, you can show them the pictures you're taking. So people are generally very nice. And uh, I've taken pictures in uh, edges of cemeteries. And, and Amy was just saying that she went to a place on a peninsula in Lake Huron. And uh, as long as you're not destroying the place, people are fine. So you got to get out, find a place. Um, composition, this is one, uh, this is the artistic section of our program tonight. And I'm not a real artistic person, but I've had to force myself to try to do a better job. Because I get so excited, I just take a picture of the thing. So I just take a picture of the Milky Way. Well, then that's boring. It's better if you got stuff, right, that's in the foreground. I'm learning. I'm, I'm not great at it, but I'm, I'm getting better. Uh, so foreground is important. Water, trees. That's what we have in Michigan. We don't have rocks much. But we got water and trees. You can work with it. And uh, watch out for light domes. Like that's a distant town that puts up this nasty light. And if, and, and if it's straight south, and you're shooting straight south and getting the Milky Way straight south, it's going to put a nasty searchlight up into your picture. So you gotta think ahead about that when you look at the map. Where am I shooting? And make sure that horizon is dark. Well, how do I do that? Well, there are some, um, is that it? Okay, there's some software I'll tell you how to do that. So where do I go? Well, you wanna go west. <laughs> um, but hey, I can't go west, I live in Michigan. All right, what about in Michigan? Well, further north is better. Let's get a little bit more detail here. Here's Michigan. And we are right there in the white zone. White is bad, very bad. So where do we go? Well, we gotta go up to the north. And so uh, ideally, you, you wanna go like in this spot here, and that is uh, the, the Osamo River. 
and the, and, and the national forests out there, Mayo and Oscoda, that's dark. I'll, I'm recommending a place there. Atlanta, where the elk are, is up there. This is the Manistee, right? Beautiful. And if you go to the UP, awesome. Okay, but that's a long way. So uh, I'm going to recommend some specific places closer, but in general, away from cities, further north. Any other questions? Anybody go to a place they thought was nice and dark? Uh, I know that uh, Adrian sometimes goes over to Point Pelee at Pelee Peninsula in Ontario. That's dark. That's pretty good. Uh, so uh, where might you go? Here are three places that are in order, the furthest from the from the uh, furthest to the closest. Alcona County Park is three hours in that dark hole I showed you. And Alcona Park is a nice county park with a campground and a lake and trees. And it's a beautiful place. And you can get there in three hours. And they have a lot of different places where you can uh, park and take pictures and have a campground. Yes. They all brown, right? Um, yeah. Or zero. Yeah. It's easier to it's ask for forgiveness than permission. What I found is setting up in parks like that, even though they say if they're open until dusk, if somebody else come by and they see you're sitting there with equipment and you're doing your thing, they don't. They just, like you said, they get curious. They ask you what you're doing. They see you're not damaging anything. And you're not, you know, partying and stuff. And they just wish you good night and move on. Yeah. Yeah, they're just fine. And, 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 uh, uh, I, myself and Adrian have been there many times, and uh, there's no gate, and you can just drive in. They have multiple campgrounds. There's multiple places where you can go. Uh, but uh, it, and it's a uh, county park because the uh, it's, there's a dam on the on the uh, Osago River there that consumers power put in, and then they donate the land to the county. And it's a very nice campground. They're very friendly. And so uh, it's a place I like to go to. The only downside is you're down by the lake, and there's a lot of um, fog at times. So if there's fog, you really need this. But it's beautiful, and it's just very scenic, and it's, but it's three hours away. OK, where can we go that's closer? Well, Port Crescent, at the tip of the thumb, that, this is a dark sky park. OK, so that's good. You don't have to go to a dark sky park, but it's nice. And this one is uh, about two and a half hour drive, and uh, it's good. And, but it is great for the northern lights. So if you hear there's northern lights, go there. That's the best spot within three hours to get northern lights pictures. Because you're shooting over Lake Huron, and there's nothing on Lake Huron. Right? There's no lights up there, so it is fantastic. Perfect rising. That's a goodie. And then closer is the first dark sky park in Michigan, one of the first in the whole United States, right, Jim? Yeah. One of the first, and Governor Angler signed a piece of paper. And it's Lake Hudson State Park. And there are accustomed to people coming in at all hours with telescopes and stuff. The picnic area. Uh, that's where the people usually go, uh, the picnic area. And uh, it's down here. West of Adrian, it's an hour, an hour and a quarter from here, from right here. So that's the closest place. That's where I tell people, you know, to go first. You want a place to go? Go there. You'll find other, other friendly people, and usually people with red lights. But you still occasionally will have the aid who come through with their brights on in their car. So uh, sometimes that requires you to uh, do this. Right. You're shooting pictures, you just have to cover it up. Like here comes somebody with a bright sign, you just can't stop because you're in, you're in a park. Any questions? Usually, about now, people say, Well, what about that dark sky park that's in the headlands up there by the Mackinac Bridge? That place is like uh, miraculously dark, isn't it? It's like the best place on earth, isn't it? I've heard so much about it. It's good, not great. Because you're right near Mackinac City, and you don't have a great south horizon for the Milky Way. You got to go south. 
west horizon, but not a good south. It is a cool place to go, and they have a big telescope, and they put on great programs. And they've done a wonderful job of promotion. But there's lots of other places you could go. State parks are great. Um, another place that I've uh, used is Portage Lake, right here. Portage Lake is also pretty dark, right there. And uh, it's pretty good for the Milky Way, pointing south. But it's also really good for the Northern Lights, pointing north. The summer Milky Way is south. So whatever. we'll talk about how you figure that stuff out without being an astronomer. Where is all this stuff in the sky? Is that concerned? So any questions? Got to get out of town. When do I go? This is it, man. Right now, we are in the Super Bowl of Milky Way. Right now. So get out there for that. If you want to win a Milky Way, like with Orion's belt, January and February. Now, for each of these, if you're willing to get to stay up really, really late, you can go a couple of months before. But for evening, those are your evening prime times. Now, we are in it right now. This is it. This is the time. Um, that is, that's a, a winter picture. That's the winter Milky Way. Avoid the moon. We talked about that. That's kind of obvious. Use the program you can get on your phone. Um, photo pills. Amy, can you use that one? I've heard nothing but good things. And what does it do? Well, it's pretty complicated. I mean, it lets you plan, you know, location, direction. Oh, the microphone. Yeah. Oh. It, 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 you gotta turn it on. It does more. Yeah, it's on. It does more than you really need. Um, but I think Sky Safari and Solarium are probably better for just where am I and in which way am I facing. But photo pills, if you want to really set up and plan a photo, you can anticipate where the Milky Way is going to rise exactly at what time. And like I want the Milky Way over that tree, that amazing dead tree with all the amazing branches. I want to get it right there. So what time from this spot is it going to be right with that tree? It'll do that. Yes. Yeah. That's yep. But Sky Safari and then Sky Guide are two awesome apps that you can get for your phone, and they they really do a good job of faithfully showing the night sky where the Milky Way is. Um, I just found out Stellarium has an app too for the phone, and that's a beautiful, very realistic software. It's the one I put on my PC if I want to. Show the night sky on my PC, still area, and that's free. But basically, what you're trying to do is saying, what's it going to be like next month when there's no moon on a Saturday night? Where's the Milky Way? And when does it go down? Boom, you got it. You got to plan this stuff. You can't leave things to random chance. So, uh, planning programs, there's many that you can use, and there's many apps on the phone that are great for planetary. Weather. Uh, so I don't want to drive three hours if it's going to be cloudy. Um, I've done it. I'm very grumpy about it. But um, my favorite is Astrospheric. It's a little complex, but boy, is it accurate. And it's as, much, as, much, as accurate as you can get. It tells you if there's going to be clouds. It tells you if it's going to be nice dark sky or if it's kind of fuzzy, that transparency. And then it tells you if the stars are going to twinkle much. But well, you don't care about that. Anyhow, uh, Astrosphere. Other people like Meteor Blue. That's another fancy one. I mean, these are really for astronomers. They're very uh, intense, but very good. And then if it gets close, you know, when we're getting the day of, the ghost cloud satellite. You can actually look at the, the cloud satellite taking pictures of us. And you can see, oh, is there a big bank coming down at me? Or does it look clear now? Like tonight, yeah, I'm thinking that, well, maybe not tonight. It's not going to clear up tonight, is it? No, anyway. So anyhow, that, that's what I do with I look at it and go, hey, it's going to clear up at 10 o'clock. It's going to clear up at 11. So, but there's lots of different ways you can get your, your weather, but make sure you, you pay attention to it. Any questions about timing? So we're going over equipment, location, timing. Settings. This is the one where I promise this. This is all the details. We go out there. What settings do I put it on? Okay. 
This one is maybe not critical for a beginner. If you're a beginner, just let just take it out, uh, however it is currently set up, which is usually a JPEG. That's the, the standard. But if you get a little bit more uh, into it and you say, hmm, I'd like to tweak the picture afterwards and I really like to turn up the color, you know, I want to make the picture sing. Well, then you have to shoot it raw. And you can set your camera to shoot in both. So every time you hit the button, it takes, it saves two files, a JPEG and a RAW. And the RAW contains all the information. It's not compressed in any way. There's no loss. You've got all that resolution. And you can do like triple the changes you can do to a RAW versus a JPEG. With a JPEG, you can turn the knobs of color and contrast a little. With a RAW, you can crank it up. I've seen pictures where I'm way underexposed. Milky Way is almost invisible. Ugh! You know, and I'm home. I, I'm like, I'm really angry. I pull off the raw. I can turn it up. It looks awesome. So the raw will fix your mistakes. So, but if you're just getting started, just go, just go with the jig. Manual focus is absolutely critical. Okay. And another thing is that, uh, you know, it says infinity here. It's not infinity. You'll find out if you take pictures of stars, you realize that infinity is not infinity. You have to find infinity yourself. Have you wasted time with infinity? Yeah. Infinity is not infinity. Um, some of the fancy cameras have this uh, automatic um, noise reduction. You need to turn that off because it can cause problems and at least it will delay you, right? The, you know how that works? Basically, you, you take a picture and then it takes another picture. Uh, and then subtracts the, the bad pixels. But if you take a five minute exposure, it's great. And then before you can do anything now, now it's taking another five minute exposure for the automatic uh, noise reduction. So now you have to sit there and stare at it and wait five minutes. You don't have to do that. So turn that off. Um, and then how much exposure? This is the toughest question is how long of exposure should I go? Well, I just discovered this week that lonelyspec.com has a Milky Way exposure calculator that's fantastic. You just enter your, you know, the type of camera or type of lens and the focal length and the speed, and then it will tell you what exposure. 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds. But if you just want to be um, do it manually, you can use the rule of 500. And the rule of 500 is there because we're moving, the stars are moving. So if I go for a long exposure that's too long, I get little streaks. Little streaks aren't nice. You want stars. You want something more like pinpoints, right? Stars are pinpoints, stars are not streaks. You can, you know, if you look really close to that picture, you probably will see that the stars are not totally round. Maybe they're like a football. So how do I set the exposure? If you take 500, and the focal length of lens. And that equals your exposure time in seconds. Let's do an example, a simple example. I have a 25 millimeter lens, 500, 25 millimeter lens. What's that? 20 seconds. Okay. So that tells you the longest exposure you can go with just sitting on a tripod, no tracker. If you want to do low cost, easy, 20 seconds is all you can go. All right? With this lens, which is a 14, it's more like 40 seconds. You do the math. Okay? So it's called the rule of 500. 500 divided by the focal length in millimeters equals the exposure in seconds. It's just a nice little um, little thing you can do. But there's something else you can do is, hey, try it. Zoom in. Do you like it? Change it right there. The trash button is the most miraculous thing we have on Earth. Okay? I just love my trash button. So, and you're out there. You're having a good time. You're not in a hurry. Right? Have fun. But and this will get you going right here or the lonely step. I have so, what do I set that on? Well, 1600, 3200, which is pretty high, right? Um, and maybe if the camera's one of the brand new ones, you might be able to go to 
6,400. Okay, so anyhow, uh, especially if it's colder. And the toughest thing is focus. It's the toughest, toughest thing. And so I always tell people is to find a light that's way, way off there and focus on that light. Not a close light, because that's just a, a light that's way off or a tree that's way off. Focus on that and then don't touch the focuser. I've even, I've even put tape on it. Once it's focused, I'll just put the duct tape on it. Because focus is really important. But live view is where you really zoom in on the focus using your camera. Focus is really important. But uh, phones seem to do a good job by themselves. And there's really not much you can do, right? Phones don't do manual focus. Well, you, you're stuck. Okay. And uh, the histogram on the back. If you look at the histogram, you don't want all the pixels on the left. You don't want all the pixels on the right. Kind of like a nice histogram in the middle. I'll show you. If you pull a histogram on any of these mirrorless or DSLR, um, well, uh, you, you get one in which is the black. This is a pure white. And this shows how many, how many pixels you have at each level. Is it totally a black pixel? Is it dark? Or is it totally blown out white, which means a star? You want to have a picture that's kind of like this. Okay? You do not want. It's all dark. Underexposed, right? And what's the other end? Everything up here at the end. Overexposed. You like this. And what's nice, if you really want to get into the details, you want the end of it touching in the middle. Towards not, you want to, you don't want that. Right? Because you overexpose these stars. Anyhow, we're getting pretty detailed there. But that uh, lonely speck will get you in a zone that's good. So you don't probably have to play with it. So that is your camera settings. And um, the last detailed slide I have is, here's your process. Do your planning, use your software, practice at home. So many people I see, they're out there fiddling with it in the dark under the beautiful sky, and they can't get it to work, or something's wrong. Well, should have practiced at home. There's a whole, how many settings are there? There's like a thousand settings on our cameras. It's just too much. So practice home, set up in advance, get there early, get your two control all ready to go, play with those settings, focus on the light, try and trash, try and trash, try and trash. Take a picture, throw it away. Take a picture, throw it away. Ooh, that's a good one. I'm going to keep that. Okay? So um, this is my uh, guaranteed success model. Any questions? We're, we're wrapping up here. Okay, post processing. This one, I had to process this one in order to bring out the car. The car was too dark. So I selected the car and I turned up the exposure for the car. That's an example of post processing. The phone can do a lot of post processing automatically, but you can have apps to do processing. But Photoshop or Lightroom is a standard. Um, but there are other. The, I, I'm hesitant to tell people to buy Photoshop, but it was invented here in Ann Arbor. Yeah, it was invented right here in Ann Arbor. Tom? Tom something? Anyhow, yeah, so, uh, but if you, or equivalent, okay? Um, there's lots to learn. Here are the big steps. You crop the picture how you like it. You stretch it, so I'm, I'm bringing out the Milky Way. I'm turning down the trees. I want more color, I turn up the color knob, and I remove bad things. Right? If there's something really stupid, I'll just kind of try to get rid of it, or there's just, there's something, there's always something you have to noise, right? So, so that goes around processing. This is where you make the picture sing, and this is where people uh, sometimes get frustrated, or they just say, I'm not going to do it. But if you want a picture that's great, you got to do it. And this is an educational slide because everybody is focused on equipment. Every time I ask people, you know, they show them, I show them what I got. All their questions are about this. 
They're not asking about the other questions. In fact, the red zone is bigger. The red piece of the pie is more important. Knowing how to use your stuff. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, and here are three websites. Take a picture of this. They're all great. They've all been going for at least five years, some of them 10 years. They're really professional, very good. How to videos, and they all talk about Milky Way photography. And uh, I go back to them, and I was happy to see, like, Lonely Speck has been updating his website for years, and it's just impressive. And there's tons of good YouTube videos, and I strongly recommend you just find one that applies to your camera, your equipment, your situation, and watch it because they're really, really good. And you can see my pictures at Instagram. I'm an Astro Picks Daily, and I've been, I have about 600 pictures I've put on there over the last few years. So you see a lot of Milky Way pictures and deep sky pictures, things like that. So that's it. Thank you, Brian. If you'd like to stick around and ask specific questions or look at some of the equipment, we have uh, several pieces up here that you're welcome to take a look at. And if you're interested uh, in going out at some point in the night for a meetup to take photos and have some uh, guidance, let me know before you leave. And we will sign you up. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much. And get out there now, because this is it, man. It's being bringing a lot of clear nights these this time of year. The moon's up, Brian. Okay, man. The moon's up. Okay, man. Okay, okay.